Today's message is going to be a continuation in our series through the book of Hebrews. Um, we're already to the 11th chapter, and we're going to uh, try to cover the entire chapter, uh, the entire 11th chapter uh, in this sermon. Um, but the focus scripture is a matter of faith. Uh, let me just bring you up to speed of where we are so far in Hebrews. So far, we looked at how the Old Testament was pointing to Jesus. How God would not lower the standards of heaven, nor would we want him to do so, but rather he maintains the standards of the kingdom of heaven, and how Jesus comes and he fulfills what we can't. And the, the writer of Hebrews is a teacher, preacher, that is teaching and connecting dots for us of how Jesus fulfills all those Old Testament passages. In fact, the last time uh, he says that it's by faith in Jesus that we are saved. If that's true, if, if that is true that a lack of our faith leads to condemnation, then we ought to understand what faith is. If it's that important, if our salvation for eternity hinges on faith, then we should probably really understand that word. What does it mean? Uh, and that's exactly what the writer of Hebrews is going to lay out today. That first scripture that Demetrius shared with us uh, said that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now he's going to go on and he's going to give us biblical examples of what faith looks like, how it's played out. He's, he's going to be like a preacher. If you remember weeks and weeks ago when we started this series in Hebrews, I said that there's a lot of scholars that believe that Hebrews is actually uh, a uh, written recording of a series of preachings. This, chapter 11, really, really affirms that. It, this reads like a preacher's preaching. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do. That's how I'm going to deliver uh, chapter 11 to you. Um, and we'll start in verses 2 through 4. They say this, For by it, that is faith, the people of old received their uh, commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. But by faith, Abel offered to God more acceptable sacrifice, a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was uh, uh, commended as righteous, and God commending him by accepting his gifts. And though his faith, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks, received his commendation, that is, he was praised, or he was rewarded for this act of faith. Now, we remember the first murder was between Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel because he became jealous that God seemed to prefer his brother's sacrifice over himself. He gave a blood sacrifice. The universe was created by God. We know this by faith. The science can't exactly prove how the universe was created, though we can speculate. But it's by faith that when you see something that is designed, that there's a designer. We've talked about this in different apologetics class, that being in, in this building, though I don't know who actually built it, actually do, but pretend I don't, I don't know who built it. Just by being in here and seeing the design, where the windows are, where the floors are, where the chairs are, where the sound system is located, where all this stuff seems to shout that it was designed by somebody. I have faith in that. I can have faith in that, is what God's Word is telling me. Verses 5 through 6, he goes on to say this, By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Faith is what pleases God. We see by faith what we cannot see with our eyes. We grasp 
by faith what we can't grasp in our hands. Verse 7, the writer goes on and says, By faith Noah, you remember Noah, being warned by God concerning events he has yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for saving of his household. By this he uh, condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Remember Noah? What a complete and utter fool he looked like. He's building an ark. You know, put all your family on the ark because it's so wet around here. You're crazy, Noah. But by faith, he continued to build the ark. And we know how the story ends. We know how the story goes. But by faith, he knew that building was something he had to do. He was convicted of that. 8 through 12, the writer reminds us about Abraham. He says, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called out to a place that he was to receive an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in a land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the, scene of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God, by faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man in him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Remember Abraham and that story? That's a story of Abraham's growing faith. He doesn't start out real faithful, but we see his faith grow. Interesting, though, he died before he could see the fulfillment of God's promise. In fact, things get so uh, desperate for him that Sarah gives him Hagar, his maidservant, to hope, help fulfill God's promise. That ends terribly bad for them. But we see that even though... Abraham didn't yet see the fulfillment of what he promised Abraham. God promised Abraham he would do. The promise was still fulfilled. The writer says in 13 through 16, These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prospered them. Now, as we look at this, we think these people left their homes, left everything that they knew in search of a promised land because God said he was sending them there. The writer says they forgot where they were from. They left that behind in search of something they never made it to. But also, don't worry, church. They were greeted when they went to their heavenly home. The writer saying that even though they didn't physically enter the promised land that God promised them, turns out he was promising something more eternal, way better than any physical land or anything a physical property could produce. How strong is faith? Well, it causes us to do that, doesn't it? It causes us to step and change out, or step out and change our direction. To step out of our comfort zone, to do things we never thought possible, or things that we never thought we'd ever do. 17 through 22, the writer says, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, 
Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked the future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of his sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of Exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. Think about this, church. Put yourself in these scenarios. Abraham, by faith, took his son Isaac. Finally had a son. Finally had a son with Sarah. Took that son and was going to go offer him up as a sacrifice. He was going to kill him. You're an old man. God said you're going to have lots of heirs. You finally have a son. <clears throat> and then God says, yeah, go, go sacrifice him to me. Are you kidding me? God, I thought we had a plan. I thought we had a plan. I thought we were going to be, uh, my descendants were going to be as uh, innumerable as the sand in the seashore. You know what he said? Okay. I don't know what you got planned, God, but okay. I'm going to step out in faith. That is faith, church. He steps out in faith because he trusts God. Would you have enough faith to do these things? Would you? By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that a child was beautiful. And they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ's greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, where he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover, sprinkling the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn may not touch them. Listen, church, by faith people crossed the Red Sea as on dry ground. But the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were grounded. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith Rahab, the prostitute, she didn't perish with those who were disobedient because she had been given a friendly welcome to the spies. Well, the preacher's preaching now. He goes on to 32 through 38. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell you <clears throat> of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Japheth, David, Samuel, the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms. Enforce justice, obtain promises, stop the mouths of lions, quench the power of fire, escape the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and floggings and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, sawn in two, and killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. Wandering about in the deserts and the mountains and in the dens and the caves of earth. This entire book, this entire book, church, this Bible, and all the stories in it, they're not there to entertain you. They're not there for your enjoyment. 
They're not there to, to make us uh, wonder about what God is like. It tells you what God is like. The reason these people endured these things is so you would have faith in God Almighty. That is why those stories exist in the Bible. That is what the writer is preaching of Hebrews. These weren't just uh, mystical stories. These are actual historical events. These happened to people. God did not preserve his word, so you had some interesting literature to study. They were preserved so we could build our faith. So when we read these things, we go, wow, could I do that? Wow, look how God came through. Every time God came through. But the preacher always saves the good news for the last, don't he? He always saves the good news, the best news, to the end of his sermon. And all these things, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Wow. All these stories in our Old Testament that help build our faith, none of these characters saw the fulfillment of God's promise through His Son, Jesus Christ. Yet they still had faith. Church, we're on the other side of the cross. How in the world are we going to live in fear? Are you, are you kidding me? I just read this preacher preaching about your heritage, of, of those you descended from. And you're on the other side of the cross. A very good pastor friend of mine made a comment on social media to which he is now getting death threats for. Yeah, right, right in Ohio. You know what his response was? Are you seriously trying to intimidate a Christian with death? Have you not heard the good news? Are you serious? You're trying to intimidate me with threats of going home? Okay. The response? That's weird. Wow, you are easy. You're not like the world. You don't fear death? No? No? Well, I certainly don't want to go early. I, I want to care for my family, but do you know what awaits? Christian, do you know what awaits? Wow, what if we had faith like that? What if we had faith the size of a mustard seed? So when we watch the news, we saw the pan, uh, pandemonium all around us. It caused us as a church to be weird, to be different. So the people actually went, really? It, you're not scared? Well, no. I want to be prudent and I want to be smart. I'm not advocating uh, for foolishness. But at the same time, what does your Bible say? We know how it ends. What could you possibly be afraid of? We descended from those that have been tortured, sawn into, stoned. And we're going to get freaked out by a, a news headline? Or where our country's headed? Or what somebody might think of us? No. Mm -mm. We need to be the, the, the calm in the storm. The rock in the harbor that breaks the waves. The people that say, whoa, 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 settle down. We read the book. We know how it ends. It's going to be good. You're going to be all right. That's the voice we need to proclaim louder than ever right now. Let's build our faith. 
How is your faith? What are you afraid of that God cannot overcome? Think about your deepest, darkest fear. The thing that's, that's keeping you up at night right now. The, the thing that's giving you anxiety. Can your God overcome that? Whose opinion do you put higher than God's? Whose is it? Is it your political party? Is it your friend group? You know all those best friends you have on Facebook that you wouldn't even wave at in a grocery store? Those ones? Those opinions you put higher than, than God's? Whose love and affection are you trying to win? You know, God died to win yours. Let's consider these things as a matter of faith. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity just to dive into your word and learn a little bit more about what you've done for us. And more about who we are in light of what you've done for all of us. May it strengthen our faith. May it cause a stirring in our heart and cause us to stand. Not on anything that we've done or any of our accomplishments or any of our anything, but on everything that you've done. This is our prayer. It's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen.